Now, let me update you on the fighting between Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is all over a breakaway region called Nagorno-Karabakh, and this escalation is now into its fourth day. This is video released by Azerbaijan's Ministry of Defense showing artillery strikes on Wednesday. We're told nearly 100 people have been killed. Hello guys, welcome to my YouTube Sunday. channel. Please kindly hit the subscribe button and turn on your notification bell. Azerbaijan. Leave a comment below and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. As Azerbaijan's territory, it's controlled by ethnic Armenians. In fact, the region declared independence in 1991 and has ruled itself since then with the support of the Armenian government. That, as you might imagine, has been a major source of tension between these two former Soviet republics. They fought a war in the late 80s and in the early 90s over it. That eventually ended with a ceasefire in 1994, which gave Armenia full control of Nagorno-Karabakh and some surrounding enclaves as well, marked in darker yellow. And while there was a ceasefire, crucially, there was no formal peace treaty reached. So this area is still disputed, as we're seeing. And on Sunday, this happened. There was artillery fire and shelling from both sides. Armenia is accusing Azerbaijan of beginning a military operation inside the region. Azerbaijan contests that version of events. And this is now an extraordinary situation. As The Guardian puts it, we have a situation where trench warfare is going on in Europe more than 100 years after the First World War. It says in some areas the lines are so close they can hear and potentially talk to one another. Now, Azerbaijan hasn't come out and reported any military losses, but we know it has suffered casualties. These pictures are from Azerbaijan today. We believe this is the funeral of an Azeri soldier who died in the fighting. And this picture was also taken today. It's the aftermath of shelling inside an Azerbaijani district bordering Nagorno-Karabakh. And you can see the extent of the damage. Next, let's hear from people in another town that's also close to the fighting. <laughs> I woke up to the sound of the bomb thrown by Armenians. Our house shook. I woke up my family, my children. We went outside, and the bomb flew over our head and fell into our garden. This has been our life for 30 years, only the noises of shelling. We are scared, we are very scared for our children, for our young people, for our babies. We want this to end soon. All our relatives are on the front line. Well, the BBC's Gunel Safarova is close to the town of Tata, where fighting broke out on Sunday. Let's hear from her. Throughout the day, I have heard sounds of artillery and shells. Today, Azerbaijan government announced that Armenian military units fired heavy artillery at the city of Tartar. And as a result, seven civilians were injured. I have talked to many people. They said that they fled the city of Tartar. And many of them say that they were living under threat of attack for 30 years, and they just want this conflict to be resolved. Now, Turkey is relevant to this conflict. It backs Azerbaijan, and yesterday Armenia accused Turkey of shooting down one of its fighter jets, killing the pilot. Today, it released this footage saying this is the proof. It says this is wreckage of the jet. Arme Armenia claims it was shot down by Turkey in Armenian airspace. Now, Turkey denies this. Here's the Armenian Prime Minister in an interview on Russian state TV. Armenia and the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh are now exposed to a direct threat from Turkey. According to our data, Turkey is looking for a pretext to intervene even more broadly in this conflict. Armenia also claims Turkey has sent Syrians to fight for Azerbaijan. Now, there's no clear evidence of that, though The Guardian is reporting a Turkish security company has recruited Syrian rebels as border guards in Azerbaijan. And here you have a Syrian journalist reporting the deaths of two Syrians in the fighting. Now, Turkish officials have dismissed the idea they're sending Syrians to fight as baseless allegations. But Turkey is clear about its support for Azerbaijan. This was from Monday. The time has come for the crisis in the region that started with the occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh to be put to an end. Once Armenia immediately leaves the territory it is occupying, the region will return to peace and harmony. Now, as you'd imagine, many in the international community are worried. The UN Security Council is calling for an immediate halt in fighting and a return to negotiations. And this is the French president, Emmanuel Macron. I have noted Turkey's declarations, which I think are ill-considered and dangerous. And I say this, particularly with regard to Armenia, 
France, within the Minsk group, in its role which presupposes the impartiality that justifies my prudence, remains extremely concerned about the warlike messages that Turkey has sent these last few hours. We also have this from Azerbaijan's president. Today he said, we only have one condition. Armenian troops must leave our lands unconditionally, completely and immediately. He added, this condition remains in force. If the Armenian government meets this condition, the fighting will stop and blood will not be shed. But of course, as he well knows, that's a very long way from Armenia's current position. Well, Fahmir Ismailov is an Azeri journalist here at BBC News and a news editor for BBC Russian. Um, Fahmir, good to have you on Outside Source. Um, they're all setting out their stalls, but they seem a long, long way apart. Absolutely. That's the biggest, pro uh, the biggest problem. Uh, we've seen the positions of Azerbaijan and Armenia close uh, to each other at some, uh, after some negotiations with the Minsk group. But uh, since then, a uh, long time ago, the positions are as far apart as it is possible. These are two really sworn enemies now. What I could do with some help with is, why is Azerbaijan pushing this issue so strongly now when Armenia has effectively been running this region for many years? Indeed, Azerbaijan has lost the war. It has lost the uh, control over the Karabakh itself and also seven surrounding regions. It uh, suffered uh, casualties as well as Armenians, but also um, hundreds of thousands of refugees, uh, which had to be resettled elsewhere in the Azerbaijan. And this is the biggest possible problem and issue for the Azerbaijani public. Mm. They feel that they've been overlooked by international uh, community. They feel uh, that they've been victims in this war and they want to return back to their homes. But uh, there's one big problem, that the two governments do not speak to each other in those terms. And I wonder, Famil, you must have been in touch with many friends, family and journalistic colleagues um, in Azerbaijan. How are they reacting to this escalation? Well, the public mood now is that there had to be war and, and if there's a war, we'll have to unite around, sort of, uh, you know, with, with the army, with the government of Azerbaijan. That probably was something that the government was counting on because with the social problems, with the falling price of oil, with the reforms that are needed in the economy, the war probably is the best possible outcome to make sure that public rallies around the leader. But after that, you know, what next? And also, uh, when I'm thinking about my generation, uh, it's our children who are fighting now on the, in the trenches of uh, mm. Karabakh. It's uh, our children on both sides that are dying. And the blood that is spilled there is the worst possible outcome in this problem. And that's what the governments do not take into consideration. The blood that will make sure that the, the, the two nations are as far, as, as far apart as possible for many years to come. Pamil, thank you very much for joining us. That's Pamil Ishmanov from BBC Russian. Well